Uh, hello, everyone. Um, this is just a review video for the final exam uh, for the Kipnis essay, Engineers Who Kill. Uh, I had some old videos of it, but um, her talking about it, but uh, they're too old. Um, and I, it's before my hair turned gray, so I'm not really comfortable with them. So I'm making a new one, which is going to be very brief and just sort of point towards uh, some of the things that I think they're pretty basic about this essay. Uh, this essay, of course, is uh, has to do with our study of the first canon, which is really the most important part of engineering ethics, the stated right here, uh, more or less, uh, in the form it is in the NSBE Code of Ethics. Um, and uh, what is this essay? Fundamentally, it uh, is an interpretation of the first canon, that is, you might say a practical uh, interpretation. The, the, the first thing that you really need to note, uh, I think, aside from the sort of introduction here about the importance of public safety, very important uh, just for understanding the thrust of the essay here on page 78 is this distinction between an ideal of the profession, what's underlined here, and a principle of professional conduct. Uh, those are two different ways of characterizing what not only the first canon is, but, but any, any of the canons. Um, and uh, both of them are valid ways of conceiving of it. But it's important to, to note that, that he's interested in the second way of conceiving of it. An ideal of the profession would be uh, an aspirational thing, as we discussed in class. Right. If we if we interpreted the first canon as something that is suggested to engineers to strive towards, uh, then it would uh, be one sort of thing. Uh, it would be an aspirational ideal. Whereas if we interpret it as a principle of professional conduct, it would actually be a rule that governs um, professional behavior, and most importantly, it's the kind of thing that you're that, that's capable of being violated. That is, we should be able to point to conditions under which uh, an engineer has actually broken the rule, as opposed to an ideal of the profession where you may just fail to live up to it, but that's not grounds for punishment or any kind of sanctions. Um, so he's interested in the first canon as a principle of professional conduct. Um, just, just look at his distinction here, and I think that it's much clearer than I put it. The ideals are aspirational in nature, calling attention to the central goals of the profession. Uh, they are important because they provide guidance in the development of an exemplary professionalism, but while they can be flouted and ignored, they cannot, strictly speaking, be violated. And that doesn't mean you, you can't violate them. It means it's not the kind of thing that can be violated. Um, strictly speaking, there's no sense in which you can violate an aspirational ideal. You can choose not to follow the path indicated by a statement of the profession's ideals. And if you do, you may never become an exemplary professional. But that does not mean you have broken some rule. Pr principles of professional conduct, however, do provide criteria for judging when a professional has fallen culpably short of acceptable standards for the profession. Unlike an ideal, a principle professional conduct can be violated. That is, there are conditions under which we can say it's, it's, it's been violated. It specifies conditions under which a practicing professional violates the public trust undertaken when he or she becomes professional. While the failure to realize one's full potential as a professional may be lamentable, the violation of a principle setting forth the minimum requirements for acceptable professional practice is a very serious matter. And that's another way to think of uh, what he's doing with the first canon. He, he's thinking of it as a, a, a minimum standard of conduct for members of the engineering profession. That is, if you fall below this standard, you have, you have basically disqualified yourself as a member of the profession. Like looking for the, the 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 floor, you might say, of 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 behavior as an engineer, like and and so what he's looking for is you know what would be a violation 
of the first canon? How would we how would we characterize behavior that actually falls below that lower limit, falls through the floor, you might say? Uh, and you, so that's really what he's looking for is a characterization of what it would mean to violate the first canon, considered as a as a minimum standard of professional behavior. And he finds it, and uh, in, in a general way, um, in uh, uh, really, uh, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for the specific word. Uh, he, he finds it for in the idea of acting as a menace. I'm sorry, I'm looking for the particular place where, yeah, right here on page, I'm sorry, it was too obvious, um, right here on page 79. Um, uh, he asks here, right here, is there a point at which the conduct of an engineer is professionally unacceptable? given the language of the codes, the answer seems to be that though engineers are not culpable if they merely fail to make contributions to public safety and the rest, they are culpable if they act as a clear menace. And I think that that is the key word. Uh, of course, it becomes more refined as he goes on, but that's really the key concept is that engineers shall not act as a menace seems to be the interpretation, the general interpretation of the first canon. That is, to act as a menace would be a, clearly uh, a violation, uh, an undermining of the spirit of the first canon if an engineer were to act as a menace. And so uh, he tells you, in what follows, I shall begin the task of fleshing out what is meant by acting as a menace. So that's one way to just characterize what Kipnis is doing in the essay as a whole. He's fleshing out what's, what it would mean to act as, for an engineer to act as a menace. Um, uh, and so, although he says, you know, there's more ways of acting as a menace than killing people, he thinks that killing people would be the most, uh, the, you know, the place to begin. Um, so he says here on the top page 80, we are concerned here at the outset with those engineers who represent the most serious threat to public safety, those who kill. Of course, you, there's more, more ways to act as a menace than to, to kill people or put people at risk of death, but that's certainly the most extreme you know, one. Well, so here on, again on page 80, uh, he starts with his, you know, a, a kind of a reformulation or a a formulation of the first canon as a, I'm sorry, I get the terminology wrong, uh, as a, uh, uh, sorry. As a principle of professional conduct. Sorry, I want to get the terminology right. So right here on, with P prime, uh, we get the first formulation of a, of the first canon as a principle of professional conduct, basically as a rule, um, as the thing that engineers should never do. Uh, there may probably all sorts of things that engineers should never do, but this is the most important. This is the this is the central thing. The engineer should not participate in projects that subject others to a risk of death. That would you know because that would mean to act as a menace. Now then, what you get in the following pages is a you know is a refinement of that because there's all sorts of problems with that. You know, like there are certainly some situations in which it's fully justified for a professional or an engineer or others to put people at risk of death. Well, you know, and he gives examples. Um, <clears throat> so then he changes and introduces the you know the ubiquitous term in our class, the degrade ambient levels of public safety. So engineers shall not participate in projects that degrade ambient levels of public safety, general levels of public safety. And I think that, that, that in our class discussions, I think that did turn into a kind of a useful expression, you know, ambient levels of public safety, because it seems to me that 
that's a, a good way of characterizing the kind of risks that engineers face or the kind of generally the kind of questions that engineers have to ask themselves where a doctor may say, well, how, how do I keep uh, from putting a particular patient at risk? Engineers are really thinking about general effects, effects on the whole population or the whole population that uses a particular product or um, is exposed to a particular project, you know, the more general ambient, ambient, you know, general environmental sort of levels of public safety. And of course, there are, you know, you can read, you know, there's problems with that. He needs to refine it. Uh, and we have to talk about things like consent. And, and so we get to the final um, formulation of it, what he's now calling the first principle which is really, again, just an interpretation of the first canon in terms of a principle of professional practice. This is on page 82. Engineers shall not participate in projects that degrade ambient levels of public safety unless information concerning those degradations is made generally available. Because he's gone through situations in which it would seem that um, imposing a uh, risk degrading ambient levels of public safety uh, might, might be something that you want to do or that a community wants to do. And if it consents to that, um, you know, he gives the examples of spraying pesticides that might affect people and how before you do it, you need to let people know, especially people who might have special exposure, uh, special dangers. Uh, in, connected with that and things like that. So yeah, okay, so engineers should not participate in projects that degrade ambient levels of public safety unless information concerning those degradations is made generally available. And again, that leads us to the issue of consent. Um, you know, he, he, he says that getting everybody's consent or mechanisms for obtaining consent for things really is outside the engineer's uh, power or competence. So basically, the engineer doesn't need to make sure that everybody is given their consent. The engineer has to make sure that everybody who's affected or potentially affected um, actually knows about the risk, you know, at least to the, so that they, you know, they, they have something that they can, they can do about it. Of course, there are problems with that too. Um, <clears throat> um, but the, the next really important part of the essay is to, uh, uh, you know, to ask, you know, what, uh, what, what then engineers are uh, required to do. Uh, and, you know, if you do realize that you're in a position where you're working on a project which degrades le ambient levels of public safety, um, and that's this uh, engineer should not participate in projects, you know, which basically requires uh, that engineers, well, not participate in projects and, and only requires that, right? As, as we discussed in class, um, that is that the rule basically says that you can't, you, you, you can't participate in such a project. It does not, you know, in itself right there, uh, impose any kind of obligation to do anything else except not participate in it. Um, and, you know, that's an interesting point, obviously, and an important point of the, uh, of, of the course. Um, he says here, uh, the top of the page, this is 83, this is not to say that engineers are never obligated to publicize hazards that they did not help to create. Uh, but to specify the conditions under which uh, engineers have such obligations would, would require analysis and principles that are beyond the scope of this paper. And as he doesn't want to talk about whistleblowing, leaves it open. But, you know, and, and I think at, at a certain point uh, says, well, it may be that engineers are required to do more, but they're at least required not to participate. And their obligation not to work on such a project is stronger than their obligation to publicize it. 
um, even if that, that, that publicizing of it would prevent injury or death. Uh, and that's resting on the old uh, ethical uh, principle that it's, it's, uh, it's worse to actually do harm than to prevent harm from being done. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the, the whole shall not participate in projects part of it is on page 84. You should take a look at this, uh, this paragraph here where he actually talks about it in more detail. So the next really important part of the essay, uh, the two um, uh, case studies, the two actual situations in which uh, engineers actually were involved in such a project. The first is the, uh, the DC-10 scandal, which basically gives a uh, rather harrowing uh, account of an engineer uh, who failed to live up to the first canon considered as a principle of professional practice, um, who knowingly worked on a a project uh, that that degraded ambient levels of public safety and and did not did not uh, quit the project. Another uh, interesting, which we didn't really talk about in class, but an interesting uh, case study here is the uh, the Bart uh, incident in the seventies. Yeah, which is uh, when San Francisco built the the Bart public transportation system, Bay Area rapid transit system. Um, there was a, an, an accident and, um, you know, read it. Uh, it it's interesting uh, because it would seem that it's a, an, an accident that would technically not be covered by the first principle that he comes up with because the, introduce, the introduction of a public transportation system will almost, even if that public transportation system is faulty, will almost always be more uh, uh, safer than, 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 than riding in a car. Um, so uh, he had to introduce a, a, a kind of a, um, an addendum to the first principle on page 87 about uh, standards of professional practice, basically safety standards. Engineers shall not violate acceptable, accepted or acceptable standards of professional practice in cases where the safety of the public would thereby be placed at heightened risk. Uh, which is an interesting thing to keep in mind, especially for De George's essay, having to do with the, the Pinto engineers, who certainly uh, might have, should have, might, it would have been good from thinking of, uh, of this principle. And I think you, you know what I mean. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, there's some other things in the essay, but I think those are the really important points. So, so read it. <clears throat>